and welcome to another episode of the Sports Tech All Stars podcast. We're keeping our themes, which I've really enjoyed doing, I must say. We've done various themes uh, until now. We've covered Sports Tech in the Middle East. We've covered a month of speaking to some really uh, great funds and Sports Tech fan experiences. And this month, all for the month of June, uh, we've got AI in sports under the spotlight, a topic that has been spoken about maybe too much, maybe not enough. Depends on which, which side of the spectrum you're sitting on. Uh, critically, positively, all thoughts aside, we've, a lot of it has been focused on generative AI, but I wanted to throw a wider uh, light on it and cover all the possibilities that AI presents in sports. We've taught, got a great lineup for you. And one such company that has been on this in the spotlight for a while is a company called Zone 7. They use AI to help with injury prevention for most likely your favorite sports team. These guys get around, it seems. I've got the CEO uh, from Zone 7, Tal Brown, on the show. Welcome to the show, Tal. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Ron. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I look forward to the conversation. Super. A little background. So, Tal, you're Israeli, currently living in California. I'm Indian, currently living in Berlin. We've covered like some nice geographies there. Anywhere else you've lived in the world? Yeah, actually, I actually grew up uh, with traveling parents. And so I spent time in Africa, spent time in Asia as well. I uh, actually got my degree in the UK. So I've, I've been around. I've been around. But um, but settling here in California for the last few years with the company has been a phenomenal experience. Uh, um, just, you know, as a, as a founder who wants to learn and grow and, you know, build a team and partner with a super I don't know, experience people in growing a company. It's a, it's a good place to, to go through this journey. Yeah, no doubt. I've actually been fortunate enough to spend, I think my first few travels, like work travels, were across uh, Africa. I spent time in South Africa and Rwanda and Swaziland. Uh, yeah, great place to be as a, as a young man. But no, we won't talk about me. Nobody's interested in that. We're interested <laughs> in you. Before we get to the company, I'm always curious about the man or the woman behind um, uh, the story sure. of the idea. So a little background. What, what, where did you come from? You've already spoken about where you lived a bit. But what took you to starting Zone 7? Like where, where did that, what is the genesis of that? Yeah, so I mean, background, I would say you could call me a third culture kid. So growing up in multiple cultures, multiple languages. Um, I ended up spending a few years working in the homeland security, cyber security space as a, as a young software engineer, uh, working on I think back then we would say big data projects, uh, cybersecurity projects. Um, I'm, I'm an engineer by training, so I was a coder and I was dealing with big data systems. And then my journey for the next decade was really in tech. I was working in enterprise software, you know, putting together products, selling them. Um, my last job before starting the company was with Salesforce. I was probably one of the first AI-focused uh, product management uh uh, guys uh, mm -hmm. asked to build a, uh, an AI platform way, way, way back. I'm talking probably a decade ago. Um, and I've always been, you know, on this, you know, place where machine learning connects with human workflow. Mm -hmm. um, and the emphasis emphasis would be on the human workflow. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not, I was never one of those guys who works on machine learning projects that just you know, create numbers and, you know, you run a ticketing system off it or you determine prices off it. I was always connecting data with a human workflow. And and that was my background. And so I did I did that for five years at Salesforce um, and then left to start this company. So joining the company or starting the company, founding it was kind of like bringing with me a lot of, I would say, domain knowledge around machine learning and how it can help human operators. But it was a fresh start for me in the sports uh, ecosystem. Um, and so it was a, a wonderful journey of learning. Uh, not not always easy, but certainly certainly uh, challenging and fulfilling. So my big question here is obviously, I mean, before Salesforce, a quick look at your LinkedIn profile will tell anyone, but you were at Oracle before that. So you've spent time in big tech. Yes. What made you make the jump into sports and why specifically injury prevention? How was that the theme that you caught? So, you know, when you, when you, when you kind of when you uh, change careers almost, then there's there's multiple factors. There was a very strong personal factor where I felt like I wanted to lead my own company. I wanted to just be a founder and, 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 and you know, I would say have that experience. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's true that it would have been more accessible to me to go and do something in enterprise software or in, you know, in big tech. Um, 
but I also had a strong urge to do something that I connected with emotionally and would have some positive impact on you know some community of people. Um, as it happens, my co-founder was a, a sports scientist or is a sports scientist. And we connected and, and I kind of like really, really like this idea of can we naively thinking, can we help reduce human downtime, right? Mm -hmm. And all the bad things that happen from it. I mean, sure, you want to do it for athletes and who get paid a lot of money, but you also, you know, our aspiring plans is to do it for a much larger community. And so that that, that really triggered it. It was a combination of you know, personal career choices, uh, uh, um, the desire to do something that has a positive impact. And also, you know, the relationship I built with my co-founder. You, you cannot underestimate how important that um, that chemistry and that uh, uh, bond uh, drives you. And, and that was that, that, that's the kind of guy I am. Right. I'm a, you know, I'm a bond kind of guy. And so there was no initial plan to go into sports. It wasn't I'm not like I'm a sports fan, but I'm not a sports fanatic. And I just fell in love with the idea and with my co-founder and with the with the journey. And you got sucked. I got sucked into it. And, you know, here we are. So um, I think it was a, it's a good case of karma uh, doing something good for change uh, on a personal level. Fantastic. OK, so it was the relationship with your co-founder, a little love affair, which took you into sports, which is a fantastic thing. Sports is a place of love, man. I've certainly been yeah, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So then let's jump right in into Zone 7. And you talked about. Maybe we'll talk about the injury prevention angle specifically, because, again, a quick look at, at your guys' case studies page presents some really good names, obviously, that you've worked with, whether it's Liverpool, whether it's working with uh, the Rangers, Queen's Park Rangers. I mean, I'm sure there are bigger names here. You've, and there are some names that are masked, you say, a Champions League club or a La Liga club, where yeah. you can't disclose names. Um, so you've, I guess, found, and I think it was the Liverpool case study that I came across because I think there was a lot of PR that either you guys did or they did. I don't know where it came from around your how you prevented downtime uh, yeah. or kept players active for Liverpool. Um, isn't it? Is it now that like everybody is chasing you for your services rather than the other way around? Because that is the most important thing for sports, right? When these guys pay millions and millions of dollars and euros to these sportsmen, at these athletes. They need them yeah. on the pitch. You have to do that. Yeah, I think. I think first off, I think it's important to say like we we did not prevent downtime. It's not up to us. We, you know, it's kind of like you have a doctor in the operating room and he's a super super expert and went to medical school and did a thousand operations. And what we do is we kind of provide him with a special X ray that helps find things that sometimes are very very difficult to find to the human eye. So use you can use a doctor metaphor. You can use a pilot metaphor. We're not the pilot. We're not flying the plane. We're not making. We're not doing the the surgery. Uh, we provide uh, insight into things that are sometimes, in, you know, I don't. I want to say invisible, but very difficult to see with other tools. Um, and we use AI to do that. Um, and you know, the case studies are interesting because very early on we realized that we're going to be in the sports industry, but. More importantly, within the sports industry, we will be operating or selling to or partnering with scientists, right? Team physicians and sports scientists and people who deal with numbers. They need to see, let's say, evidence in the format of what would resemble scientific evidence, right? Um, ultimately, you always want to have a peer-reviewed paper published in a big uh, academic uh, um uh, journal, but but they, they need to see data and they need to consume it as they would consume any other knowledge that that a scientist would like to see. And so we decided early on to be quiet for a few years. Um, I don't like to saying stealth, but I you know we were quiet. And then when we felt we have enough case studies, we started to put them out there in a very transparent way. So it's not just a slide with numbers. It's like a 10, 15 page write up with how we do it, why it worked, where did it fail, right? Where were the injury rates not high and why and all that stuff? So the journey of creating case studies for us has been really interesting. And we feel that, you know, sometimes it goes well and people respond well to it. And sometimes it's still like, hey, I still, you know, somebody on a team could say, look, I'm a scientist. I've been studying this for many years. It's not enough for me. I need to see it in my own environment. I need to test this with my own hands. And, you know, that happens sometimes with big teams like Liverpool and sometimes with smaller teams. Uh, it just depends on the on the scientist. And, you know, if I'd be a scientist and this new thing would come out and say, oh, we can do this, we can do that, we can use predictive technology, I would also be skeptical. So 
It's totally natural. So the case studies reflect a very, very careful journey to create, and I would say data or evidence that, you know, points to value that we can create. And, you know, when the stars align, then the impact is there. Uh, but but ultimately, the impact is, is, is because the human operator has been able to, you know, include us in their process uh, um, and, uh, and include this thing called AI into their very well-considered um, uh, expert process. Staying on that, talking about this human operator that you're dealing with, what has been the change and let's say your sales cycle of how you're talking to these operators over the last, like, has there been a tipping point or do you feel that it's still to come? Like over the last, what point did you stop after explaining what you were, let's say the core genesis of what it is going to do and just focus on, hey, this is something that you need. Now we can just get to commercials and see whether the math makes sense. Or what yeah, has I that think- I think I think three three things. There's three types of I would say it's not it's not a binary tipping point, but there are three vectors that are driving um, our growth. One vector is that you know five years ago when we started the company, every team had what we would say um, movement monitoring, like a GPS vest that measures running and jumping and all that. Everybody had it, but that's all they had. So we were like a tool on top of that. Today. Almost every sports team has multiple sensors. They measure game data. They measure training data. They measure gym strength, flexibility, sleep. sleep. So, so naturally, the, 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 the challenge of unpacking, analyzing, all of that is bigger. So that's working kind of like towards, oh, if we are spending so much money on collecting data, maybe we also could use some help analyzing it. So that's that's one track. The other track that's working here is, AI is no longer well. AI is no longer like this weird, dangerous black box thing that people in other in other industries do, right? Football or basketball. Everybody uses data and analytics in scouting. A lot of them use it in tactical analysis of opponents, and so there is more familiarity with needing to or wanting to run a data project or a data process on on one of our verticals. And I think the the medical side is coming in now. Like it's it's been behind on scouting for obvious reasons. Um, it's easier to spend money on analytics when you're paying somebody you know millions and millions of dollars. But it's also happening in the medical department. And I think the third vector that's working for us is more about us. We have adjusted our 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 not our, uh, not our sales workflow, but actually yeah as well, but our narrative. So we're using predictive technology, but we're not predicting injury. People hear predicting injury and they think this thing is going to tell us which minute on the game will happen a tackle and what what that tackle is going to create. It's not a magical you know, Harry Potter prediction. It's a scientific forecast that signifies elevated risk for a specific period of time. And the human operator can use that, right? They're not going to be able to use, don't put this guy on the field today, but they can use something like, there's high risk for the next few days. If you maybe modify how you prepare for a game in three days, there's a chance you might be able to reduce the risk and, you know, uh, and overall, over time, over a larger sample, be able to to drive availability uh, to, to where you want it to be. So those three things are influencing how we're changing and how the market's changing in the favor of companies that... Uh, that do similar projects. And I can also say it was really, really hard. It's still hard, but it was really, really hard a few years ago. You know, it was hard to get attention. It was hard to get trust. Um, every one of those case studies reflects not just work we did, but also somebody with vision and faith in us and said, hey, let's, you know, I think the industry is going to change. Let me take a bet on a young company. And, you know, those case studies reflect uh, these wonderful uh, <laughs> partnerships. I remember being at a talk by Roberto Martinez, the, uh, I don't know if he's still the head coach of the Belgium football team. I think he's in Portugal now, yeah. No, he's Portuguese switch. Yeah, uh, I remember him uh, giving a talk. This is a couple of years ago at one of those sports tech conferences. And he was talking about, like, somebody from the audience asked him, well, what is the one piece of innovation that you wish you had right now? And he basically described, like, I wish there was, like, a capsule <laughs> or some sort of room or a door or a window or whatever so that a player could walk through and I could just tell how they're doing. Yeah. Like how match ready are they? Like what muscle is the hamstring tight? Is this ankle good? This and that. And I remember thinking then, I remember thinking of you guys and a couple of other, like this whole injury prevention, monitoring, management, red zone, amber zone, green zone, 
kind of thing is so, so critical. And now, as you said, I can imagine it was maybe difficult a few years ago, but surely now everybody just gets it, that this is mission critical to get to make sure that people are healthy. Like you see the NBA playoffs and how uh, yeah. our team fluctuates so wildly between when Kwai is, uh, is injured versus Paul George, is, like whatever, without getting into the teams. Um, but the fortunes of the team depend on so, so wildly. So surely it's getting easier for you guys to make that pitch and, and do it so so well. Uh, let's talk about that a bit. Let's talk about the success studies, uh, the success cases that you've had. And which are the ones, maybe apart from Liverpool, that you yeah. really feel um, like, hey, we, we made a difference there? Yeah, so so we can certainly discuss that. Um, I think for us, for for like the way we like to measure our success internally is with two types of metrics. Metric number one is, are we accurate in being able to forecast a risk scenario. And essentially, we use standard statistical methods, right? Over a season, there may be, you know, let's say a bunch of injuries, let's say 50 injuries for a football team, for a soccer team. Um, sometimes it's 20, sometimes it's 70, but let's just pick 50. And when you analyze a season of data, sometimes usually we do that in retrospect. So we kind of say, hey, give us Give us access to data from last year and let's analyze it in retrospect. So we create an algorithm for that client and we tune it and then we show them results. Retrospective, of course, but we show them results. Hey, out of those 50 cases, here are all the cases that we would have been able to provide you with, uh, call it a risk flag or a risk alert, uh, a forecast, essentially. That would have been correct, right? So an injury was preceded by a flag that said there's high risk. Um, and for that to be successful, that flag needs to be timely. Like it can be a, one, a month ahead and it needs to be a couple of days ahead. Mm-hmm. So we analyze that and we provide information. And, and there's a set of metrics around the accuracy of the forecast. Um, how many of those 50 were you able to flag is one important metric. That's what we call sensitivity. But the other one is, were you flagging every player every day? Because if you were, then... You know, every, you probably would have flagged every injury, but it's unusable. Like nobody's going to use a system that introduces so much what we call noise. So you need to have a good, uh, a good amount of uh, of accurate, well, a good amount of accuracy, which you know we can call specificity, which is essentially how good are you at not you know making noise. <laughs> um, and usually we reflect that as the number of flags per day, right? If you're a coach, if you're Martinez and 17 of your players are flagged a day, it's unusable. If two are flagged a day or three or one, then it's usable. You don't have to do a lot of changes, but you can focus where you need to change. So that's that's one set of metrics. And across the board, we typically have something like 70% detection rate in a, in a football environment. Basketball similar. American football, rugby is a little bit lower because there's more contact. The other type of metric we like to we track is over time, over a season or half a season, was there a change to the downtime? So call it availability if you like. Um, and you need some time for that. You can't do it on a weekly basis. You need for enough incidents to have been accumulated. Um, and we like to track that as well. And so some of the case studies talk about, you know, 40% reduction in either the volume of injuries or the volume of days lost. Uh, 40% is a big number. It's a big, it's a big number, but it's, it's not entirely up to us. There, there, there's a human operator and that operator needs to trust the flag, right? And it also needs to have the ability and the motivation to introduce a change. And that's the key thing here. A change could be, let me talk to the player. Let me see how he's feeling. Maybe he's going to tell me something and it's going to be pain or it's going to be discomfort. Then there is a, a maybe diagnostics. Oh, if, if, if a flag was correlated with bad pain, let's, let's scan the leg. Let's do an ultrasound, whatever. Then you could look at some corrective work in the gym. Right. If, if the flag is indicating a hamstring risk, maybe we do some specific hamstring related drill, drills or, or strength exercises. And then another way to impact is to say, and this is where the term load management comes in. We provide a flag, but we also say, look, it's two days before a game. Typically, two days before a game, you guys do, I don't know, speed work. This player should actually do a little bit less of sprints or maybe a little bit more of something else. Sometimes you're at risk because you're not enough workload and sometimes you're too much and so the human operator needs to go through that process and they need to you know apply their own discretion and expertise and 
hopefully create some change in the in the environment. And so when all those pieces come together, you you know you you end up looking at case studies that have have these impacts. Um, it's not always forty percent. It could be ten percent. Could be fifteen percent. Uh, some uh, Queen uh, QPR, for example, Queen Queen Park uh, Queens Park Rangers. It was a it was a team that when we came in already had a very low injury rate, um, and you know even improving that by ten percent is a huge win. Um, and then also sometimes it's football and it's sports and things fluctuate and there's a lot of variables we don't control. Right, Zone Seven is not like uh, autopilot. People don't just follow it blindly, and so things can fluctuate. But it's about the process and the workflow. Are we helping people? Uh, analyze the information in a more repeatable, uh, objective way. I think we are. And are we able to accelerate their workflow, right? The alternative is to look at 10, 15 charts on a computer per player per day. Right. And then have a discussion about what's the right amount of change in sprinting and jumping and whatever. So that process can be accelerated with with uh, the tools and the insights that we provide. Trust the process, control the controllables. And then the most important one, what you ended on is like actually focus on insights. Like what are the things that the data is telling you rather than just giving you reams and reams of data. Uh, quickly, before we move on, I want to have, you touched on a, one important aspect there, which is the player themselves, the athlete themselves, because yeah. you are basically science-backed, talking to a science-backed individual, which is say the doctor, the physio, whatever. But uh, this whole conversation is about the player. How receptive have you seen players be to your kind of tool like i mean you'll have met on one end of the spectrum you'll have players who are no i'm always fine and they build a rock like a holland or a bruno fernandez who always want to play 90 minutes but they might be in different zones versus somebody else who's maybe hey we can push you out in the field you're not and you're not as bad as you say that you are like how how receptive have players been to this kind of data and this kind of uh, technology yeah so i the, the the honest truth is i don't know because Zone 7 is kind of like an insight generating algorithm, right? Call it, I don't want to call it ChatGPT, but like a um, diag diagnostics helper or a modification helper that is in the hands of the coach and the doctor and the, and the, and the trainer. What they do with it is up to them. But what do you uh, hear from them? I mean, indirect feedback. Um, you know, indirectly, I think that Again, depending on on the culture of the club, and this is I'm, an uncontrollable. It's not uncommon for the staff to go to a player and say, "Look, you know, we want you to be 100% for Saturday, and it's Wednesday. Let's make a few tweaks today and tomorrow, and see where we are." I don't think that's landing badly. Um, I also don't think that a club would say to a player, "Hey, you're not playing tomorrow because the the app told us it's not going right. to work." Um, so. So I so we've taken this approach of we want to you know we can provide information to the to the club to the staff they decide with it and they incorporate that into their expertise. Other tools in the consumer or individual fitness space actually just you know deal with the athlete, with the athlete right. If you're a runner, you're using Training Peaks, you get information to you directly. Yeah. Um, but for us, it was a different journey. So we are you know we are a tool of the hands of the pilot. We're not really dealing with the passenger. As you said, you're trusting the the pilot. You're just giving them the right tools, and then they will have carry that information forward. Speaking of going forward, what next, Tal? Where where do you guys head? Like, what's coming up in 23 and 24 and beyond? Yeah, great question. Um, I think for us in the football soccer space, we have so it was our first market. We've you know, we're not done, but we are in this kind of scaling state, right? More teams. We've got new clients in new territories: MLS, Mexico, uh, more countries in Europe. Uh, one case study I'm really proud of is Napoli, who just won the uh, Scudetto. Um, and they were somewhat of a skeptic early. Uh, earlier on, they were, they were skeptic. And, you know, we were able to, to contribute to a, a very healthy and transparent learning process. Um, the next, So it's about scaling in football and soccer, as every startup wants to scale. But it's also about um, adding more verticals, quote unquote. And so we have early clients in NFL. We have uh, early clients in the basketball environment, um, so that that process is going to happen and is happening already. Um, and we're also working in military environments as well. Think about the military athlete who it's very expensive to train and very expensive to lose when they have an injury. And not all injuries can be uh, prevented in that space, just like sports, but 
big numbers, right? You know, if you can reduce downtime, if you can help guys reach later stages of their military journey in a better state, then that's a, a worthy goal. So for us, it's about those those projects um, in 2023. Coming full circle, you came from some sort of military background and now you're serving the military as well. Yeah. And I would say another thing that we're seeing is that governing bodies in sports, leagues and federations are also starting to work with us um, across more sports than I mentioned here. I mean, Actually, that was care. on that. Like, how many sports are you catering to now before you complete your answer? Uh, probably four. Um, probably four. We're very selective in going into a new sport. We need, you know, we need the commercials to work, but we also need data, right? Right. We really want to do things like, I don't know, I'm not going to, I don't want to talk bad about tennis. I will love the sport, but like it's, it's, it's more of a, dis, a decentralized data environment. Rugby has a lot of data. Basketball has a lot of data. Football. So we kind of focus more on team sports for now. Um, where data about the player, the game, the schedule, um, medical data, it's all available at scale. Um, and so governing bodies are starting to work with us, and which is great because they also are beginning to or already deploying an agenda around player health and player availability. Um, when the best players aren't playing, like the example you mentioned in the NBA, then, you know, you're not only are you not only are you, you know, kind of like losing revenue in a way, but you're also, you know, you're a rogue environment that creates you know, uh, non, non-ideal uh, um, safety. Yeah. And so player safety and health is a huge, huge trend now for a lot of governing bodies. Yeah, I think one of the companies that we were working with last year uh, as Sports Tech X actually got picked up by NBA's Launchpad. They, they had a whole accelerator program or a startup challenge, call it, which was just focused on ankle health or solutions that focused on player ankles because obviously... It's a German company, player. right? Yeah, better guards, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, we, and we were the ones like, hey, there's this program running. Why don't you go apply? Because this is as good. Like, if you're not going to get in there, like, then I think you should all just go back home. Um, but that's the kind of stuff, like, as, as you said, leagues taking this topic, the NFL, of course, famously about head injury and concussion. Like, they take their uh, case studies, very those use cases very, very seriously. Yeah. To make sure, A, that yeah, more players are on the pitch, the biggest names are on, on the field uh, for most of the time. But also as a league, you're seen as taking the topic seriously. So I, I get that case completely as well. All right, I think we've motored through and I'm trying to conscious, be conscious of time as well. We're doing super well. So I'm going to bring my last question home, uh, which is my favorite one to ask. I like to believe that we're all sports fans first. Um, so I'd like to end on what has been your favorite sporting moment, either one that you participate, watched as a fan or maybe participated in as an athlete as well. Uh, wow. Wow. Uh... My favorite sporting moment. So I, uh, when I was six years old, I was uh, as a kid. I watched uh, Maradona win win the well Argentina and Maradona win the World Cup. I was a kid. I was watching it on one of those old TVs. It was color, but it was very granular. I remember it very clearly, and it was a, it was an insane summer. I was I remembered watching those games. The you know the hand of God goal, the, the finals. So I think for me as a kid, that was a really powerful moment. Um, I'm also a huge Kobe Bryant fan, so I got up early for his uh, for a lot of his games. But but that's that that you know following his career for me has been very emotional. And and before you know, and, and I would also say this: one of the most powerful sporting experience for me was San Antonio Spurs winning that championship in 20, 2014. I watched the entire playoffs for two years straight, and I was just I was almost with tears. And my daughter was just born, so it was a very emotional moment. So there you go. I gave you three good answers. Is that the, Sorry? Was that the Heat? Yeah. Yeah, they lost to the Heat 2013, you know, yeah. game seven, game six, insane drama. And then they won the, They won like in five games in 20. Yeah, they all with the J- game six and then they lost the game seven. Right. And 2014 was like a redemption. And it was just for right. me as a fan, it was, you know, I was getting up at 3 a.m. to watch every playoff game and it was just, just wonderful. So thanks for, thanks for bringing those happy memories. Okay, quick. I, I, it'll be remiss of me as an NBA fan to let you go without a prediction. How are we doing? Heat Nuggets? What do you feel? Uh wow. Uh my heart is with the heat, but by you know, by by half a point. Uh yeah. just because the, the I like I like the coach and I like I like Jimmy Butler. Uh but you cannot not like the Denver Nuggets. So this is for me, it's not a case of good versus bad. It's like two very teams I really respect. And I like the underdog uh making it all the way through. I really like that. Incredible story. Yeah, I'm the same. Heat fan, Jimmy Buckets has been amazing this playoffs. But uh, to, to see these names uh, come into the finals. Also, there was so much 
like not hate, but like knocks against like the finalists from the bubble edition of the NBA. And it was the same final four, um, maybe a slightly different finalists, but um, incredible to see that good teams will all survive. Tal, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Okay. And uh, yeah, if anybody wants to reach out to you, uh, yes. what's, the place, what's the best place to find you? LinkedIn, your email? Or either LinkedIn or super easy, tal at zone7.ai. T-A-L at zone7.ai. Yeah, there you go. All right. If you re- want to reach out, if you're a club who's looking to reduce your injury downtime or you just want to know more about uh, EI-based injury uh, management, then I think Tal's your guy. Thanks, Tal, Thank for joining. You. All right. All right. That is a wrap for this episode. We're going to keep this series going. I've already had a couple of great conversations. We have more lined up for you. Yeah, and sports, such an interesting topic. See you guys next week.